everybody, and thank you for joining us. My name is Lee Randa. I'm very, very pleased to be here with Leslie McDowell, who, funnily enough, is one of the first people I met when I moved to Scotland about 26 years ago. I know. Leslie is a novelist, a critic, an author of nonfiction, and an educator. Her novels include The Picnic and Unfashioned Creatures, and her nonfiction exploration of relationship, which is called Between the Sheep, Literary Liaisons of Nine 20th Century Women Writers, who shortlisted for Scottish Book Award. And she did her PhD on the work of James Joyce. But tonight, we're talking with Claire March, which is her new novel about the misunderstood, often excised from history, stepsister of Mary Shelley. And Claire was among those on hand during the fateful trip to Lake Geneva that gave birth to Shelley's masterpiece, Frankenstein. This novel has been described as thrilling, gothic, and feminist, and we'll be going into all those corners. There'll be a uh, reading, and uh, we're going to chat, and there'll be time for your questions, should you have any. And afterwards, I know Leslie will be signing books. So first of all, can you give it up for Leslie and the bell? So you see in the acknowledgments for the book that the germ came from something Claire Tomlin wrote. But what I really wanted to ask was how much was your immersion in the uh, research for unfashioned creatures really the progenitor of this? Because that was about a real life friend of Mary Shelley. And the second half of this question, because you know I go on, is um, I think everyone has certain eras of history that really appeals to them, certain topics that appeal to them. Why this period, these people, this era? Um, well, the first part of the question is with Unclassified Creatures, that was the book I wrote because I couldn't write this one. Um, because I'd started, it was Claire Claremont that I got really interested in um, after reading this introduction to Maurice of the Fisher's Cot, which was um, a novella that was written by Mary Shelley for the children. Um, and the introduction had this um, piece by Claire Tomlin, and it was all about uh, really kind of like their afterlives after Shelley died. There was, there was and really about lost children. It was really that, that sort of resonated. But also, she said about Claire, um, she went off to be a governess in Russia and live in Paris. And I thought, oh, this is amazing how. how did this happen? I just thought I'd, I'd heard about Claire before um, when I had studied Shelley and Byron at university and I knew that she'd had a child by Byron and I just thought she'd gone off and died because that's what happens when, when they just had children out of wedlock. They just disappear from the story, they just die in a ditch somewhere. I didn't know, she didn't, she didn't, she, she went to Russia, this is amazing. So I found a biography about her and her life was amazing. It was fantastic. I, thought, I, I can't believe I don't know about this. And also, when she's an old lady, um, a collector, an American collector of letters, comes to visit her in an apartment in Florence. That's turned into the Aspen Papers by Henry James. So she's immortalized in the early years of her life and at the end of her life. I, I love Henry James, but he does have a man kill her in that story and she survived them all. She didn't get killed off by any means. So. We'll talk about Yeah, we'll talk about that later, right? Um, so anyway, I tried to write it then, and I tried to write that story, and I had Mary and Claire in a room, and I couldn't get them out, which sounds insane, because you should just say, well, they got up and left the room, but I couldn't do it. And so I had to leave it for a while, and I just I didn't really know how to write fiction. It was the first time I tried. So it took me a wee while... Um, I tried again, still couldn't do it. And then in my, the course of my research, I, I came across in Mary Shelley's biography, this stuff about um, Isabella Baxter Booth, who was her friend in, in Brossy Ferry when Mary lived up here. Um, and I thought, oh, I could maybe write about her because there was practically nothing about her. One of the problems I think with Claire was there was so much information. Um, there were two volumes of letters and there was a big volume of journals as well. So her voice was really clear. Isabella had practically no voice um, because there aren't any, there's barely any letters or anything like that. So I could just imagine it. And I, I found that a lot easier to do. So that was that was how Unfashioned Features happened first. Um, 
Yeah, and I, I think with, with Claire, this book, I think it developed as I got older because certainly when I first looked at this in 1998, five years ago, um, I thought Shelley was wonderful. Shelley, I still think Shelley's the best poet that England produced. I really do. I think, I think he's amazing. Um, on a personal level, my view has changed. I do have a question about Art Monster. <laughs> So yeah. I'm going to torture you now by going back to the bit where I asked about why this period, why do these oh, yeah. people have such a grip on your imagination? Yeah, because that's that's Mary and Isabella and, and Claire. And the person I'm writing about just now is also from you know the 19th century. Although I grew up I first started reading historical fiction, I started reading Jean Plady novels. I remember when I was about 12, and it was um the young Elizabeth and the young Mary Queen Scott. And I still love that whole period. I, I love the Tudor period. Um, but it's never occurred to me to try and write about it. And I don't know if it's, this sounds a bit fancy to say it's about the Enlightenment, but I think it is. I think it's it's that split. It's be careful. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's pre-Enlightenment. I can't, I think pre-Enlightenment, it's, it's almost like it's just too far back. I, I'm not sure I can get into the heads of people before I mean, this is this is hard enough. It's it's pre Darwin and pre Freud, really. Um, although the ideas about electricity and all this are coming through, but it's I think that point is just too strange. The other question I want to ask you again before we go into Claire specifically is, um, I share your fascination with forgotten women. I share your fascination with women who are. Written out, of, given even though we know that men write the history anyway, or traditionally have, this is changing now. Um, women are written out of history, um, especially if there's a, they're standing next to a, a quote unquote great man. But I want to ask you why you think some some women are written out harder than other women, <laughs> Claire being one of them. Why do you think? And again, so. Sort of both specifically and generally, why do you think that is? I think with with Claire, with her particular situation, she is such a problem for Byron and for Byron biographers. And bio, Byron biographers are dedicated fans in in the most. Um, they absolutely adore him, and she is a problem because she really holds up a mirror to the worst aspects of him. The other stuff that he does is pretty bad too, but it's kind of it gets kind of explained away in a kind of, oh, you know, boys will be boys kind of way that he's just, because he's just behaving in a sort of libertine fashion and all this kind of stuff. There's a problem with how he treats his wife, um, Annabella Milbank, and there's a problem with how he treats Claire. Annabella Milbank can't be pushed out of history because she was married to him, but she is a, a problematic figure. And there's a there's a really brilliant novel by Benjamin Markovitz called A Quiet Adjustment, if you're interested in this, who writes about the Byron marriage. And I swear to you, it gives you it just gives you creeps. It's so it's so good. Um but yeah, I think she's a problem for Byron and Claire's a problem because of what happened with their child, because he was horribly neglectful and he he bars her, he prevents her from seeing her own child who dies, and it really is a, a part of his life that biographers, his biographers like to skate over. So there, there's, this, there's this push, I think, and you, you forget really how, how huge Byron is in the canon, actually, and you're starting to get a sense of it this year because it's the bicentenary, that, that the machine is building up to, I'm already seeing articles about what he, he is and, and how wonderful he was and all this kind of stuff. And, um, and I, I think that's part of it, that she is she really is a, a, a counter to that particular narrative. Do you think it's all troublesome women that get pushed aside and the dirt over the, the dirt over them when the historians get to work? It's amazing how just standing up for yourself is called troublesome and difficult. And that's that's yeah. what that's yeah, what she course. is. That's that's what she does. She stands up for herself, she tries to get access to her child, and yes, it's and I see that in reviews, certain reviews, where um, although they, they like the novel, Claire is described as troublesome and difficult. And you're just like, from what perspective? Exactly. Uh -huh. exactly. 
So let's set the scene. Who was she? Okay, so she's she's born to a woman called Mary Jean Vile. And I've had quite a few people say to me that she sounds really fascinating and subject for a book, I think. Um, Mary Jane had two children out of wedlock, a little boy Charles and Claire. And all we, we don't know very much about her. We know that just after Claire was born, she ends up in a debtor's prison. And after she comes out of this, um, a local curate helps her write a letter to a man called Sir John Lethbridge. Turns out to be Claire's father because she demands payment monthly payments and she gets them. When she's got this money, she goes to London and she moves into the same street as William Godwin. We don't know if it was intentional or if it's by accident. William Godwin, of course, is widowed and Mary Wollstonecraft died giving birth to Mary Godwin, we know. So he's got two little girls, Fanny Emily from Mary Wollstonecraft's previous relationship with Gilbert Emily and the newborn Mary. So it's kind of, in some senses, it, it could be a marriage of convenience because these are two people who need somebody else to help them. They've both got two children. So that the two households come together. Um, but they also, it, it was, it, it seems to have been a happy marriage. They, they have a child themselves and have a little boy called William. But also Mary Jane Vile um, starts up a, a bookshop, a children's bookshop, and she also publishes children's books as well. And she is the only woman at this time in London who's registered as a publisher, a woman publisher. She's the only one, which makes you think, you know, she, she really must have been quite quite someone. Um, I, I don't know how much, again, we, we really don't know much about the, the time that she spent in debtor's prison, but, and whether she had Claire with her, but quite clearly Claire spent her early months probably in prison. So Claire is in this household from a very, very tiny, tiny little girl, so she and Mary do grow up together as yeah, sisters. And um, just a year. There's just a year between them. Mary goes up to Scotland when she's about 14. That's really the only time they're kind of parted. And then when Mary comes back, Shelley has been visiting the house. Mary is 17, Claire is 16, when Mary and Shelley decide to elope to the continent. Shelley has a wife, Harriet. Um, who's pregnant with his second child, um, and they take Claire with them because Claire is very good at languages and she's really helpful on the continent, but also Shelley likes her. And this is kind of, and this is really when the pattern gets set. They keep, they, they go away, they come back, they go away, they come back. And this is, again is about her mother. I think Mary Jane Vile is really interesting because when they do run away, she's the one who goes after them. William Godwin doesn't, but he's just, you know, oh, what do I do? She chases them. She gets on a coach. She goes to Dover. She gets a boat over to France and she finds them and she gets Claire and she tries to persuade Claire, Claire to come back. Claire's 16 years old. She's, she's having a time of her life. She's having an adventure. She's like, no, I'm not coming back. So our mother goes back alone. But that, that, that pattern of sort of running away. Oh, another interesting thing as well is when, so they're on the continent for a couple of months. They run out of money, of course. So they come back get the boat back to Dover and in Dover they run out of money completely and Shelley writes to Harriet, the abandoned wife, to say I need some money to get back to London. She sends him the money thinking that he's coming back to her. No, he's coming back to say let's start a commune, let's all live together, let's you come and live with me and my new mistress and she's pregnant by this point as well and Claire's there too, and Ben Hawk can join, and all this kind of stuff. And Harriet's just like, "What are you kidding?" Um. So yes, that that that's kind of, and that that's how it goes. <laughs> a thing that I think is really really interesting about both Mary and Claire, and a lot of women. Whenever I read biographies about women, especially in this social class, who become embroiled in relationships and become either infamous or the teenagers. Uh, the fact that we're these are teenagers. And a lot of their behavior can be chalked up to that. I think it's really interesting that Shelley runs away with Harriet, his first wife, when she's 16. And then he runs away with Mary when she's 17. He liked he liked teenage girls. 
Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot of that. But also, yes, I think I think there is that sense of it's no accident that in Pride and Prejudice, Lydia, the youngest daughter, runs off with with him when she's sixteen. Um, so that's obviously considered the dangerous age. That's when girls will do silly things. And I do think, but I do think Claire's life is such an interesting encounter to Jane Austen because you know, we, we, we've kind of absorbed Jane Austen as, as a culture of this is what it was like then. This was the Regency era and this is, it was all about marriage. It was all about making the right marriage and, and you know, a man of money, all the rest of it. And if, if you do run off like Lydia did, your life is going to end in the toilet. It really is going to be disastrous. Well, Claire is a complete example of the fact that that isn't necessarily the case. And I think that might be related to what you were saying earlier about why Claire has been kind of pushed to one side or marginalised. She tells a story that runs counter to the social message that marriage is what a woman needs and a home is what a woman needs and all those things in order to be happy and successful. And Claire rejected all of that. Because she she could have gotten married a couple of times and didn't. Yes, um, multiple proposals. The only one she actually accepted was um, her friend Edward John Trelawney, who was kind of like a sort of um, pound shop Byron, really. Uh, he, he really admired Byron, who dressed like a pirate, and he would go and he would fight and do all this kind of stuff. Um, and he adored her. And he does propose to her, I think it was in the 1830s when he's had a, a child by somebody else and this woman's gone off or whatever and a little girl called Zilla and he tries to lure Claire. Claire has lost a child and he says, you know, here's a little girl and you to come look after her. She's like, you're and he says, no. And then she gets really, really ill. She can't work. She's got no money. She's really depressed and she thinks, oh, maybe I should. So she writes to Trollani and says, right, okay, I accept your offer. And he's like, no, no, you said no, not, not getting it now. Nah, that's it. It's all over. <laughs> but they stay friends. They stay friends. That's the only time she, she, as, as far as we know, that she actually said yes. Thanks for longer that ran around with Mary. Um, yeah, there's nothing that really happens. No, I didn't mean Mary. it. Sorry, I didn't mean run around. Yeah. That way. I just meant <laughs> they also knew each other. Oh, <laughs> oh yes. He, because he, he kind of made a living writing memoirs about, Byron and Shelley and his time with them all and everything, which is quite funny because he only really got to know Shelley a couple of weeks before he died. Um, but he did know Byron a little bit better, but then two years before Byron dies. Um, but yeah, he's he's quite he's quite unscrupulous, but he's he's quite a good friend to her in a way, and he's the only one, they're the two survivors really of that whole kind of group. He he lives two years longer than her, but yeah. So before I ask you to give us a little reading and a flavor of the book. Let's talk about um, this could easily have been written as nonfiction. There's loads of information out there, and you've done your homework, you've done your research. What, why choose fiction? Does it, is it because human lives don't work in beautiful structure? structures? Is it because you get to invent things? What, what's the lure of fiction over nonfiction? I think it is the, the idea that you can imagine certain things and you're free to imagine stuff. I think I think with biography you can you can kind of suppose a little bit you you can do a little bit of of sort of guesswork but not really too much and I think I think it's really about how it takes your imagination and and someone like Claire just made me think how what earth was to go inside her head on all those occasions not just in the Villa Dia Dati in Geneva in 1816 when they're telling ghost stories and she's pregnant to buy and what it's not just those big moments. There are other moments as well of her. I just thought, this is so fascinating. And, and although it, her, her letters and her journals are amazing, they're really frank, they're really emotionally open. Um, there's a lot of things as well that she's not she's not telling us. Um, and we know that because she says that. She just hints at certain things, like the fact that she is clearly seeing someone when she's living in Paris, but we don't know who it is. Oh, well, we, we, we won't do any spoilers. I, I always think that every novel begins with um, a question the novelist wants to answer, a why. I'm wondering if the why was to be the first one. Um, 
especially when the novel is about a historical person. I think I think the why would, would would really be about survival, not not necessarily why did she do what she did in the beginning, because I agree with you about there's she's full of youthful energy and 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 taken along on this sort of roller coaster ride, and you can you can kind of see how that would has happened. It's more about um why she persisted in the beliefs that she had, why she didn't want to get married, why she didn't want certain things, why she stuck to those principles when when so many people just let them fall by the wayside. Mary did. I mean Mary the minute Shelley is dead, Mary is back in in London and, and behaving as nicely as she possibly can. She becomes the great widow. Absolutely, yes. And and it's interesting that it fascinates me that that Claire goes even further east. <laughs> I sort of suggest the novel at one point is like to get even further away from Mary, but I don't know that it necessarily is. But it it's it's almost like she has to push for for more experience and more experience, and that, I find that very interesting. And so the novel is written primarily in three time frames, and we go back and forth and back and forth. Um, I like it because it lets us actually have three plans. Three, because we see without seeing the actual moment, you know, when um when the, the creature climbs out of the slime and it stands on two legs, we see the evolution of this woman um as she goes from teenager to um much older woman. But that was a that's an authorial choice. How did you make that choice? And um, I I kind of write like like that anyway. I've, I've always kind of done it in like different time frames that, that sort of like usually a dual time frame because I, I, I quite like the sort of post personal third or first person point of view. So it, it's to sort of try and get the sort of different points of view that you need, but without just, and also I get, I just get bored with a kind of story that just goes from A to B to C to D and, and, carries on in that sort of linear way. I, I quite like it to be quite circular and to to, to go back on itself. I, I quite like that. I'm I'm finding out that some people hate so, sorry good read. <laughs> never never read good read. I did once. I had I I know it everybody says don't do it and I thought I'm just gonna have a little look. And it was really interesting though it's fascinating because it splits half and half. The ones you know who Shelley Byron are or whatever and and he's like I was just like they love it. The ones who don't are just what's going on? Who is Mary? I don't understand. <laughs> Maybe read the book jacket. <laughs> Maybe read the jacket flaps before you launch it. Let me ask you again. I in one of your interviews you talked about the surprising way that history disrupts our notions of the past. So what just left with you with this one? You don't remember Did saying? I say that? <laughs> well, I wrote it down. <laughs> I wouldn't have made that up. Well, okay. true. I think in terms of, I think what I was meaning, or I remember that correctly, I think I was talking about how it changes all the time. Um, and so what you think at one point is one thing, it, it then becomes something else. So, I mean, a really good example is Claire's own history. All her life, she believed that her father was European, possibly Swiss. Um, because of the name Claremont, it's quite, it, it doesn't sound like an English name, it sounds quite European. And of course, that's what she liked herself. She liked you know, sort of European, cosmopolitan, she liked all of that. We don't know if her mother ever told her the truth. She never mentions it in a letter or a journal. I think she would have been horrified to find out that her biological father was, you know, a 40-year-old baron deep in the English countryside who you know, went to the pub all the time because that's what her mother was. She was an innkeeper, and I think that's probably how they met. She had a very different kind of fantasy altogether. So that sort of thing is really interesting. And we only found out about this a few years ago um, about who Claire's father really was. So it, it's... And the other thing that's interesting too, I think, is... And this, I think, comes into what, what I like about history, the fact that Claire's being Claire Claremont, both those names are made up. So her surname isn't real because her mother invented it. And Claire is made up. She was, she was born Jane. So that kind of invention, the fact that the book is called Claire Bond, 
in history, she is referred to as Claire Claremont, but Claire Claremont as such doesn't actually exist in a historical sense. So I, I like that. So she's a self-made woman? In every sense, yes. You want to read us a little bit to give the flavor of the book, and then I have more questions for you, and I know you all have a question. This is going to be tricky to hear. Okay. Is this working? Yep. Yeah. Uh, so this is from this is the first section in eighteen twenty five in Russia, and this is. Claire in her local governess's room in Big House out in the Russian countryside. Like I said, it's three years after Shelley has died and after her daughter has died. But she blows out the candle, smoke from the burned wick fills her little governess's room, fills her nostrils, her throat, sparks a memory. So she breathes in that she imagines she would have done that day three summers ago if she'd been standing by his funeral pyre on the beach in the Ricci as she'd wanted. Smelling his body burn, or what was left of it, after the fish had eaten his face, his hands, taking him up into herself, bullying every last ashy dead scent of him. Dear God, but she'd wanted to be there. Mary, again, don't leave me, don't leave me. Alba was there, though. Alba was there the in the barn. So she was told afterwards. Ah, uh, but she could have defied Mary, insisted on being present. Then she'd have been there by the pyre, positioned between him and Albert one last time. Let fire rain down on her just as it like it did before. And how it did rain down once on her before she remembers. Blood rain. Pioggia de Fangue, the locals called it. Rain would mix with the hot red sand from the south. Those cold and hot drops and come pelting down, streaking every surface with terracotta tears. That hot Sirocco wind whirling up from the deserts of Africa. The colours left by the wind might be pretty, but it was too wild for Mary. Like a dangerous tiger stalking outside the house, it kept Mary indoors, lying on a chaise. Ah, perhaps she's being unkind, for Mary couldn't, wouldn't get up. Not after all the bleeding that began with such a rush, only a bath filled with ice could save her. She'd held May's hand while her sister's teeth chattered, rubbed her fingers until the colour came back to her cheeks. Stroked her hair as the beating, beating slowed, then wrapped her chilled and naked body in all the blankets she could find. The baby, baby Mary's last, was gone. But on the day of the blood rain, Mary did get up. She had no choice, she said. There was still no news. Shelley's boat still hadn't been sighted from the Borno further along the coast, coast, where he'd gone to visit him, Albert, of course. The source of all the pain she's ever felt. Mary told her husband before he left that she hated him, that she was sick of his continual nightmares, of his hysterical screaming about whatever visions he's had, of his disloyalty to her. She wanted, she said, never to have to look in his face again. Claire hears every word, clear as if it's being shouted next to her little governess's room right now here in this house. She shivers. After that terrible row with Mary, Shelley went to the village and bought plastic acid. He'd kill himself. He told Mary, fine, Mary had said. She wouldn't even say goodbye to him the day he sailed to Lavorna with her friend Edward Williams. Edward's wife Jane joined Claire as both women said goodbye. Well, she understood his nightmares better than Mary, perhaps, after all the ones she was having herself. He grasped her hand sadly and said, Endings have to be faced or some such thing. She couldn't make it out for the wind of the whip, the wind of the beach whipping her hair about her ears. But when she shouted, What? he was already waiting out to the boat. But on that red sky morning, two weeks after he and Edward sailed to Livorno, and four days after both men were due back to back in the Ricci, Mary had said, I'll go mad if I don't go and look for him myself. Claire stared at Mary's coffee, sitting untouched. Wouldn't you rather I went? She was thinking of Percy, only two and a half years old, that his mother. But Mary shook her head. Look after my boy for me. Many times after the day he sailed away, Claire had watched the sea from the terrace wondering if she'd heard him right. Endings have to be faced. Mary had spent that time facing nothing. 
And so when it was Mary's turn to leave for Livorno, accompanied by Edward's wife, Jane, Claire had stood and watched the empty road on the other side of the house, long after Mary put up an umbrella to shield herself from the red rain and climbed into a carriage. That day, the heat soaked through her thinnest dress, wet as the rain outside, leaving her arms and her back and her legs slippery wet. Her hair frizzed so much she was tempted to cut it all off. She turned away from the window eventually to go to her person who was napping and his mother left. And then she took a last look at, across the sea. The sun was setting slowly on the horizon. It looked as though the sea was on fire. The house was still in silent though. Thick vines trailed over the terrace. Tiny lizards raced, raced across cracked stone floors. Wet leaves slapped as the wind blew them back and forth. Storm petrels hovered for a few seconds, then were carried away by the winds. Yes, the world was on fire. It seemed to her that day that she was the only one left, the last woman. Thank you. So, obviously, we see her in 1816 when they're in Switzerland and all the really, really famous things happen. How did you pick the other two charges to write about as well? Um, and maybe explain it to her. Sure, the, the other two time periods are 1825 in Russia, when she's a governess, and 1843 when she's living in her own apartment in Paris. Um, those two, I, I always wanted to write about her in Russia. Um, and it, it's quite important because she's the governess to a little girl called Dunia, who is the same age as her own daughter Allegra when, when Allegra died. And also there's there's interest from another tutor, a German tutor called Hannah Gams, and there's it's it's like another sort of crossroads moment where she has to make a decision about what she's going to do next. So, so that seems quite crucial. By the time she's in a Paris apartment in 1843, she's 45 years old. She's learned a lot. She's she is quite a different kind of person. And also, the, the, the time in Paris really kind of carries, there's a little bit that carries all the way through. To me, the relationship that was most important, actually, in Claire's life is, is her relationship with Mary. I have some questions. <laughs> yeah. And that carries all the way through. And, and there's, a, there's a moment in Paris where anyone who, who, who's read a biography about Mary knows that she gets blackmailed at this point. Um, and it was really about that I wanted, that really fascinated me about the relationship between the sisters at this point in, in Claire's life and, and how it impacted on what happens later and, and what her decisions are later as well. There were lots of other bits that I could have chosen, but then the book would have been, you know. Yeah, no, you, uh, authorial choices, they're very important. Uh, let's, uh, let's talk about the relationship with Mary because it is, it is true that Clara wrote to Byron. She reached out to him. Um, at that point, Mary was already involved with Shelley, and to some extent, which perhaps we don't know the full, Clara was herself in a relationship, a friendship at the very least, with Shelley. Um, I have a sense of real sibling rivalry, even though they're stepsisters, real sibling rivalry between them. How much did Claire, do you think, your Claire, wrote and reached out to Byron because it was, if Mary can have a poet, I can have a poet too. There's a lot of, there's a lot of that. Most, most biographers do think that, or they assume that Claire is being competitive, that she, there, there's, it's difficult because in the 1870s, Claire was visited in Florence by two men. One was Edward Silsby, who Henry James immortalizes in the, the Asperger papers. He's come, he's a collector, and he's come to get Byron Shelley's papers. He wants to buy them from her. She's also visited by a young journalist called William Graham. Um, William Graham writes up a series of articles later based on what Claire told him. And he asks her about this meeting with Byron about why she first wrote to him. Claire tells him it was Shelley who asked her to write to Byron because Shelley was, as she says, Byron mad. And he had previously said, we know this is true, but he had previously sent Byron his poetry and 
kind of stuff. So he, he in that sense, it almost like using there's this kind of this bait. Edward Silsby, though, tells a slightly different story. Um, he says that Claire wanted to, or that Claire told him that she wanted to be a singer and an actress. And Byron was then on the board of the Drury Lane Theatre, and that's why she wanted to write him. Also, she'd fallen out with Claire, uh, with, with Mary and Shelley a little bit, and she was annoyed at them and wanted to kind of, you know, show off uh, what she was doing. So you get two kind of like counter views of this, and it's really interesting to see which one has been taken up, and it's, it's Edward Silsby's ones. His notes have been referenced. They were discovered by a woman called Marianne Kingston Stopping when she was editing Claire's letters. So it's that Man Kings is stopping produces the two volumes of Claire Claremont's letters, and she is the one who finds those these notes and she puts them in her edited version. This is in 1995. Every biography you read after this about Shelley or Byron or Mary Shelley references Marion Kings and Stopping. Does not re- I haven't found a reference to William Graham in any biographies about any of this group, and that includes Richard Holmes's Shelley the Pursuit, which is so detailed, it's massive, it's a massive biography about Shelley. And he's very fond of Claire as well, he's very pro Claire, but he even he doesn't reference William Graham, but he does say that he thinks of his own fact that Claire was urged by Shelley to write to Byron because Claire was living in Shelley's lodgings at the time, so he could he must have known about it. And I got the impression from your novel. That Shelley was pulling the marionettes through. That's what I think. I mean, that's my take on it. I think I think he was. I think I think he was manipulative in that way. I think he <laughs> this is a man who left a trail of dead women and children behind him. Yeah. You know, he's yeah. he's <laughs> no Byron was, was mad, bad, and dangerous to know, but Shelley was, I think, also dangerous. I in different ways. Can't argue, can't argue with that. Um, one of there's a um, common wisdom. Um, I'm on a quote says that all historical novels are really novels about the present day. And while I was reading your book, I felt that so many issues about consent and control and emotional and physical abuse cropped up so often that it felt very modern to me, even though these events happened hundreds of years ago. And I wonder if you could talk about your version of these men as manipulative art monsters. Yeah. Oh gosh. Um small question. Where to start? Well it's difficult because Claire is essentially she's 18 years old, she's pregnant to um uh, the equivalent of a pop star, you know, somebody who is famous and rich and sexy and dangerous and all this kind of stuff. She has no power whatsoever. She has no money. She has no, um, you know, big backers behind her. She doesn't have a, a prominent family. Yes, her stepfather is William Godwin, but he's a little bit useless. Um, so I think he's broke because Shelley's fine out there and have to die. Yes, and, and Shelley is also dependent. Shelley is hilarious because he he's a revolutionary. He doesn't want he, he he petitions his father to be disinherited. He doesn't want to inherit the property or the title because he doesn't believe in any of that. But he does believe in daddy giving him an allowance so he doesn't have to get a job. That's as far as it goes. Um so it's it's interesting again also with you know, Shelley still has some power. And he does say to Claire, I mean, the reason when they leave Geneva and they go back to England, they, they settle in Bath. And he says to Claire, you know, you can't live in the same house as us because if my father finds out that you're pregnant and you have a child, he'll think it's mine, everybody will think it's mine. And up until this point, his father's pretty furious that he's left his wife and has a mistress and he's having children with. You know, the, the allowance is hanging by a thread. Um, and if, if his father thinks it's, that Claire's having a child as well, that's 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 all gone. I think with, with women today, um I think that same sense of feeling powerless is there possibly in relationships. And certainly if you look at social media and the way that um young women are 
expected to behave, I think, and perform, I think, well, we're still in a patriarchal society. There's still there's still less power. They might have a little bit more money. They might have a little bit more um, status. They might be able to get a mortgage in the way that, you know, you couldn't at that time. But there's, there's still an inequity in terms of power relations between men and women. And I don't think that has changed quite so much. And also, I think that the, um, particularly with things like uh, oh, the the cases with um, you know, video porn and 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 girls being videoed and then blackmailed over and all that kind of stuff. The book I'm writing just now is actually a Victorian version of that, and it's happening. It's still happening now, and it was happening then, and that I find that extraordinary. Well, I mean, there's Shelley with his big ideas about. Love, um, and all, and all, and you know, the best world in the world. God knows, you know, I'm all for all that, but it never works out for women, does it? Even in the '60s, biology is against us, and in those days, biology was really against them. It's not even just biology. In a matriarchal society, free love would be great. It isn't a matriarchal society; it's a patriarchal one. So. Free love for women is is a problem. It's difficult. You don't have the power. You don't have the same things that you would have otherwise, and that's why. And Claire towards the end of her life writes about it. We've got a fra- fragment of a memoir that was discovered a few years ago, where she says free love. Uh, she calls Byron and Shelley monsters, monsters of free love because of the damage that it does to women, and she was a victim of it. Although she didn't necessarily feel that at the time. Talk a little bit about just how badly Byron treated Claire. It's it was actually really quite hard to write because it's you don't want to go over the top and and just sort of create a caricature of somebody. The worst part really is when she's trying. It, it's afterwards in Geneva. Something I'm convinced something happened because. In Geneva, she's going up to see him, staying overnight, all this kind of stuff. And then all of a sudden, he turns around and says, you're not allowed into this house anymore. That's it. He completely bans her from the house. And we don't really know why. I don't think it's just because she's told him she's pregnant or anything like that. <coughs> there seems to be something else, and we don't know what it is. Claire's journals from that period, she destroyed. And Mary destroyed quite a few of her journals as well. So we don't have the women's perspective on it. We've still got the men's, but we don't have the women's. <laughs> um, what was I going to say? Oh, yes. So so that's what happens in Geneva. Um, he never speaks to her again. They, they, they have a meeting about what they're going to do when she gives birth. And we, we know this from much, much later on. Claire said it was agreed at that meeting that she would hand the child over at about 18 months old. And she would have her child every summer. The first summer in 1818, she has her child. She, <coughs> she um, After her daughter is born, she has her until she's about 60 months old. April of 1818, she hands her child over to Byron. Byron is in Venice having parties, doing whatever. Or he doesn't care. He passes the child on to the Hopners, who are um, the British consul in Venice. This little girl is really unhappy. She's wet in the bed. She's crying. She's not getting on. The nurse Elise is with her, who's been with them since 1816. And she writes to Shelley and Claire and says, this is not on. They rush to get her. And Shelley negotiates with Byron. They settle in a big house that Byron's rented just outside Venice. And Claire has her for the summer. Now, this is interesting because... I didn't know that this is the last summer that Claire ever sees her daughter or has with her daughter. Because I kept thinking, nobody mentions this. And I thought, I must have got this wrong. And I'm going back through letters and journals. I'm going back through all the biographies, even the biographies about Claire. Where is the state? Nobody, nobody says it. It's just kind of forgotten about. And I think it's kind of overshadowed by the fact that um, Mary's little girl, Clara, dies um, tragically in October. And that's where all the focus goes. Just eight months later or so in June 1819, her little boy, Mary's little boy, William, who's about three years old, three and a half, 
and he dies suddenly and it's awful. Mary is suicidal and Claire writes to Byron and says, I can't have Allegra for the summer because it's going to push Mary over the edge and I've got to watch her every single day. So she sacrifices something, I think, there for Mary. And I think that's often forgotten about as well. The following year, though, that's when a rumour is spread that Byron believes that Shelley and Claire had a child together. And that's when Byron really starts to say, no, you're not, she's not getting my daughter. She's not, my daughter's not going to be with her. So he's got Allegra. He has a young mistress, Teresa, who is 19 years old and doesn't care about children either. So he's fed up with this little girl annoying him. So he puts her in a convent and she dies and when she's when she's five. That part was really hard to write as well because all the letters that Claire is just writing and writing and saying, please, would you just let me see my daughter? That's all I want is to see my little girl. Just before she dies, a couple of months before she dies, Allegra sends it's heartbreaking, this little notes to, to Byron basically saying, you know, Papa, will you please come and see me? I haven't seen you for ages. She thinks Teresa has missed it. It's her mother because she can't remember Claire. He ignores her. He just ignores her. He ignores her. He ignores Claire. And then, of course, the girl dies. So that part was, that was really hard. That was, it was upsetting to write. And it's, it's one of those instances where you just wish you could, you could make it different. You really do. That's the really hard thing about writing about actual people is you can't change the fact. It's interesting because if, if I had made that story up, I could never have done that. I mm -hmm. could not have done that in fiction. It, it was too cruel. Yeah. Yeah. But there's a there's a tremendous sense of the pathos of child of losing children. And I think it's very easy for people to forget that even though it was a frequent occurrence, that doesn't mean it was not an emotional thing. And also it was avoidable. Um, it didn't have to happen. And there is one Byron fan who I follow on Twitter who said um, about Allegra, Claire's daughter, oh, well, you know, there's such a high rate of children dying in those days. And you're like, yes, but if you stick your child in a convent in a part of Italy that is swarming with disease, particularly in the summers, and you've been warned about that, that it's dangerous, then... That's on you, really. It's 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 really to do with you, how you look after your children. And oh, Shelley, not. yes, and Shelley was the same. Shelley was was pretty kind of cavalier about it. I do think there's Claire's a little bit of a, a theory about um, when he sails back from Livorno to the Ricci when he when he drowns in the storm. He sets out on a day where no other boats are going out because they all say the storm is coming. It's you you're not going to survive it. He goes out anyway. And just before he, he left on the trip in the first place, he'd been having nightmares about a little girl coming up out of the ocean. Um, and, and he was screaming in terror about it. And she thinks it's possible it was possibly suicidal. I mean, I think that it, it might well have been out of guilt. And you he leaves so he leaves her but what was for her a substantial amount of money. It is well. We think that was good. Uh, no, because he did it um, at the very start when Claire first tells um, Shelley that she's pregnant, and uh, when he first finds out, and Byron is quite clear, he's you know there's not they're not going to set up home together. Um, Shelley uh, makes an alteration in his will. There's six thousand for her, and there's six thousand for her child, which Mary doesn't know about, and that's a source of quite a bit of tension as well. Mm -hmm. oh, we have just 10 minutes left, so before I carry on asking all my other questions, does anybody in the audience have a question? Raise your hand. So we have, we have quite a few questions uh, from uh, people watching online, so That's I can start with those. Uh, so the first one from Jean is, uh, as a writer of nonfiction with so much research under your belt, how do you disentangle from that and actually make room for fiction? And is there anything that you would not kind of like fictionalize? Or where is the line? Oh, that's really interesting. Um, I think 
I think with biographical fiction, what you're really doing is looking for the gaps in the story, and there, there always are. Um, some lives lend themselves more to secrets and betrayals than other lives do. There are some writers who live very, very dull, boring lives, and there's nothing, there's just nothing there. But this lot were fantastic. I mean, there's just, there's just so much. Um, so you, I think you, I think you get a sense for what makes for a strong story. Um, and I, I do think that my experience writing for newspapers, doing literary journalism, probably helped with that. I sort of managed to get a sense from reviewing a lot of fiction and reviewing a lot of biographies as well, what might work and and what might not work in terms of of fiction. Like I so said, that's why I, I I think I couldn't do clear initially. I didn't have enough experience to know what I was looking for and know what what gaps were the right ones. We have uh, more questions online, unless someone in the room has a question. No hands are raised. So from Sarah, and I guess this is a question that we have touched upon, is that uh, we seem to be in a moment of retelling of the stories of a lot of lost women. Why do you think that is happening right now? Um, oh, gosh. Uh, I, think, I think there is more interest but also i think there's more historical work being done um i mean you do kind of depend on the historians coming up with more stuff and uh, and i think that's revealing more things and and asking more questions and it's just more interesting i mean really do we need another biography about churchill do we need another one no we don't we don't I have to say, not just women, I would, not just men, I would say the same about Jane Austen. We don't need any more about Jane Austen. Do you, do you not think it's also, I have a fascination with social history. And when you stop talking about the laws they enacted and the wars they went to, and you start looking into the domestic lives or the careers that women had, you get more into the social history. And for me, that's partly, a, apart from down with the patriarchy, it's also partly like, oh, this is how they actually live. Yeah, I wonder if also there's a there's a kind of there, there's a, a very kind of like, you know postmodern period when history and historical fiction was all about uncertainty and you were mining for sources and it was all very muddy and it could all change at the last minute and you saw that in fiction and things like the French Lieutenant's Women and Gabriel Garcia Marquez you saw all that kind of uncertainty which is quite exciting and then you had the tv historians people like simon shaman and david Starr who come in with what was very kind of character led and, and very male character led history and i found that quite problematic because i thought well, how am i supposed to just am i just supposed to forget that history is muddy and all over the place and there's multiple sources and multiple versions of things and I think we're kind of going back a little bit. I think I think people got a little bit tired of that kind of this is the version, this is what happens. And I think we're getting interested again in stories from other people. I think the the new attitudes towards um enslaved people as well, the kind of stories that are coming out, the kind of work that's being done then is really opening things up to what we thought was a situation. There's there's a brilliant book, um, because I was researching this for for a different story a couple of years ago, there's a brilliant book about enslaved women who won their freedom, this is in the West Indies, won their freedom, and then started buying enslaved people. And you're looking at this and thinking, wait a minute, what are, are they just perpetuating the cycle? And then you look at, they're buying women and children. They're not buying young men to work in the fields. They're buying women and children, and they're buying children that they are then giving a profession to, they are putting them in training and apprenticeships and all the rest of it, because there's no point in, in buying a child and then freeing that child because that child is just going to get kidnapped and taken right back in slavery all over again. So you, you start to see how they kicked back against this really kind of overwhelming sort of force. And that's a story that's just not being told. And, that, and like you said, those are all human stories. It's about it's a very human urge. How on earth, I was thinking of slavery, how on earth did you fight against that? And you, it, it's, there's something hopeful about seeing these these small movements and these small actions that, that give you something to, to kick against. 
If I have time for one more, if there's another one from online. Uh, yes, there is one more from Evan, which is that uh, there is uh, a lot of uh, clever humor to Clara's voice. Is that something that uh, you found in the letters and the papers that you uncovered, or did that also come a bit from you? A lot of humor, did you think? Yeah. Yay! Thank <laughs> you. I think she's funny too. Um. Yes. Yes, yeah, she was funny in her letters and she was funny in her journal. She was also, I mean, she would, she, there were highs and lows. She would be quite funny. She would also be very, very, you know, dark and melancholy. And she was, she, well, she was forging a trail and that's not an easy thing to do. But um, thank you. Yes. I think she's, I think she's funny and, yeah. You. My, my, yes. my sense of her after reading this novel was that um, he used the current jargon. Claire had all this main character energy. But she <laughs> went to the party where they were all main characters. They were all <laughs> poor Polidori. They were all main charactering all over the place. And she kind of got pushed to the side. Absolutely. And it's why well, it's why she needed a novel from her point of view. Because yes, absolutely total main character energy. She she is the character of all the story. And and what I think is really fascinating is that once they are gone, Shelley and Byron gone, she has 50 years of main character going on it's just that nobody's paying any attention because there's other things going on until now who is the question around that which is really what's been percolating in your mind for a long time and then we are in this moment where that so that same percolating idea of these main character women that didn't get their main character moments and then and we have this way of publishing that is putting these women in their main character roles. How is that for you as a writer in terms of finding a publisher? Were people receptive to her as the main character? They came to me. Okay. Yeah. They came to me. Um, I'd written about Claire before. I'd written um, a blog post about her letters and her diaries and all the rest of it. And they came to me and said, Oh, and they also knew about Unfashioned Creatures as well that I'd written about, about Mary Shelley in, in fiction before. And they said, just wondered, yes, <laughs> my, my dream project. So it, I think having the confidence of somebody saying, we'd be really interested in this if you would be interested too. I was just like, oh, let me at it. And I think it just made me suddenly go, yes, this is, this is the moment. After all these years of kind of, like you say, sitting and waiting, and sometimes writing is like that. You just got to sit and wait for the right moment. I I work as an editorial consultant, so I get scripts through all the time from different agencies, and I will regularly see read manuscripts. I think just beautifully written, lovely stories. It's just not their time. I know publishers won't take it because it's not not tapping into anything that's happening, and they'll say they have a problem selling it. Um, but yeah, that doesn't mean it. it its moment would come. Thanks. I'll just remind everybody that the book is on sale in this lovely bookshop and that Leslie will be signing copies should you wish to purchase one or several. It's not too soon to start buying for Christmas. <laughs> and then before we break for the night, can I ask you to give it up one more time for Leslie Michelle? Thank you, Lee.